Well, good morning. It's been an interesting ride preparing this. I, I want you to know that I had a beautiful PowerPoint presentation done. I had graphics, I had bullet points, I had a story. It was all just wonderful. And then Monday as I was working on it, I couldn't get any traction at all, nothing. It was dry as dust and I went, what are you doing to me, God? So you're not getting that one. You're getting something else. And when that happens to me, it's usually an indication that uh, God has a, it's a wrong message or the wrong time. And, and I had something similar happen to me in Thailand where I had a message to prepare. And I got so many different scriptures that were completely unrelated to each other. And I couldn't make head nor tail out of it, but I went to the village where I was supposed to preach and I began speaking and, and, and afterwards everybody got up and there was, like, there was like eight or nine different things that hit. And it hit all these different people. So it wasn't, my message wasn't scattered, it was pointed, but it was pointed to individuals and individual groups. So I hope that's what's happening this morning. Um, I'm usually very active during worship. Uh, and usually I'm either flagging or dancing or singing or doing something. Um, but last week I felt like I was supposed to just sit quietly, not say anything, not do anything. You may have noticed that, Terry. I was just kind of plunked like a mushroom. Yeah. <laughs> it was refreshing, I know. <laughs> you didn't have to duck and dodge. But I asked the Lord a question while I was sitting there, and it's a dangerous thing to ask the Lord questions because he usually answers them, and sometimes you don't want to hear the answers. And I'll get to that question in a bit, but first I want to give you a little bit of background. A few years ago, our television self-destructed, and we got a new one. And I noticed that the sound on that television just didn't work like the other one did. I had to turn the volume way up. I had to turn it up at least 20% higher. And when I complained about the TV to my wife, Patricia, in her loving and tactful way, explained what the problem was. She said, and I think these were her exact words, she can correct me later, probably will. Her exact words were, it's not the TV, you're going deaf, you old coot. Now, since that time, I, I began to wonder if she was telling me the truth or... But I've oftentimes... I've, I've, she said something and I've heard something completely different. And I, I picked out a couple of cartoons that uh, sort of illustrate that point. So the, the first cartoon is for the men, so if the ladies want to avert their eyes, that would be a good thing to do. Brad, could you give me that one? <laughs> and cartoon number two for the ladies. All right. So after fighting for a while, you can uh, go back to the first slide again, Brad. After fighting it for a while and, and being living in denial, I had my hearing tested. And I wear hearing aids most days. And the hearing loss comes from ex long-term exposure to noises on construction sites wearing inadequate protection, hearing protection, and being in a rock band and wearing no hearing protection. I remember when I was about in my 20s, we had this group that I, was a, that I sang with. And we used to practice in this couple's basement. Uh, the, the young kids and the mom and the dad were upstairs and we were downstairs rocking out. And one night I got really thirsty and I got, went upstairs to see what was, to, to grab a drink of water. And mom and dad were sitting there with their coffee cups and their saucers on the table. And the guys were still down there practicing and the coffee cups were going like this back and forth across the table. 
So, when I was a younger Christian, this is some 30, 40 years ago, the Lord spoke frequently and clearly to me, and it was an exciting time because it seemed like I had prophetic words, words of knowledge, words of wisdom pretty much every week, and that I had words for just about everybody. Now, that may be a bit exaggerated, but I'm trying to make a point. The lyrics to Keith Green's song, My Eyes Are Dry, did not apply to me, and I want to just give you those words. My eyes are dry, my faith is old, my heart is hard, my prayers are cold. They didn't really apply. And I know how I ought to be, alive to you and dead to me. But as the years went by, the Lord wasn't speaking nearly as often or nearly as clearly as he used to. And probably none of you have ever felt this way. At least I hope you haven't. But I do. I miss the frequency of new words, visions, and dreams. They do come, but I seem to be suffering a form of spiritual hearing loss. And the Bible speaks of a time when Israel suffered from the same problem. So I want us to turn to Samuel, 1 Samuel 3, 1 to 14, slide 4, Brad, please. Can you read it? Ooh, that's tiny. Try and follow along. <laughs> The, uh, the first line of that, the end of the first line, was what really got me after I asked my question of God. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. Now, in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare, and visions were quite uncommon. And that got my attention. One night, Eli, who was almost blind now, had gone to bed, and the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And I asked why the lamp of God was significant, and it was just a, a time place, because the lamp burned throughout the night and went out in the morning. So it was the middle of the night, and Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle near the ark of God. And suddenly the Lord called out, Samuel. Yes, Samuel replied. What is it? He got up and ran to Eli. Here am I, he said. Did you call me? I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go back to bed. So he did. Then the Lord called out again, Samuel. And again, Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, my son. Eli said, go back to bed. Samuel did not yet know the Lord because he had never heard a message from the Lord before. So the Lord called a third time, and once more Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. Did you call me? Then Eli realized it was the Lord who was calling the boy, so he said to Samuel, Go down again, and if someone calls, say, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed. Notice it didn't say he was sleeping. And the Lord came as before and cried, Samuel, Samuel. But Samuel replied, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, I'm about to do a shocking thing in Israel. I'm going to carry out all my threats against Eli and his family from beginning to end. And I have warned him that judgment is coming upon his family forever because his sons are blaspheming God and he hasn't disciplined them. So I have vowed that the sins of Eli and his sons will never be forgiven by sacrifices or offerings. Wow. What a great first prophetic word. Unicorns and rainbows. Imagine little Sammy, who served blind old Eli, his boss, and this is what the Lord says to you. What are you going to do with this word? I'd be shaking in my boots having to deliver a prophecy like that to my boss. And Sammy is well aware of Phineas and Hopney's actions because he's been at the temple most of his life and he's seen Eli's sons misbehaving and Eli hasn't done anything to correct their abuses of power. So what could Sammy expect from Eli? He's delivering a negative word Wow. Imagine Sam standing before Eli, his boss, with a knot in his stomach, his eyes gritty from a sleepless night, his mouth as dry as dust. 
Would he withhold the message believing it's not the right time? Would he ignore it and forget about it? When God speaks to us, we have the same choices. The following line, slide five please, says all we need to know about the rest of Sammy's night. He stayed in bed till morning, but it doesn't say he slept. Samuel stayed in bed till morning and then got up and opened the doors of the tabernacle as usual. He was afraid to tell Eli what the Lord had said to him. But Eli called out to him, Samuel, my son. Here I am, Samuel replied. What did the Lord say to you? Tell me everything and may God strike you and even kill you if you hide anything from me. So Samuel told Eli everything. He didn't hold anything back. It is the Lord's will, Eli replied. Let him do what he thinks best. And as Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him. When everything that Samuel said proved reliable, and all Israel, from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord, and the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and gave messages to Samuel there at the tabernacle and Samuel's words went out to all the people of Israel. Obedience in the face of possible danger. If I withhold a word that I've received because it's inconvenient, the right moment may pass. And in doing so, I've missed what God has for me and for the person that I was supposed to be ministering to. I may convince myself that it's not the right time because I fear being wrong. And then forget entirely about the word and miss what God wanted. Not everything is to be delivered immediately, but delay until the word is forgotten amounts to disobedience. Disobedience has the effect of dulling my spiritual hearing. It, eff it effectively makes me, it deafens me. It deafens me. It makes me hard to hear what God has for me because I have stepped into the realm of disobedience. It has that cumulative effect over time to gradually reduce the amount of my ability to hear what God is saying. Walking with God for a long time also has a sense, well, they talk about the, the honeymoon period where you, you first come to know Jesus and everything is new and fresh and wonderful. Well, that didn't happen for me. What Jeff was saying was true. The first thing that happened to me was I went into a terrible depression immediately after accepting the Lord. And everybody around me was saying, are you you're a Christian now? Isn't life wonderful? It really wasn't, I wanted to kill myself. I was in, a, in the dark despair, depths of despair so dark that all I could do was sing one song over and over again to keep from ending my own life. And the song was this, to him who is able to keep you from falling and present you unstained at his glorious throne, to Jesus the Savior be glory and majesty, power and honor to Jesus alone. He's love everlasting. Tomorrow and yesterday ever the same. Throughout all the ages, today and forever, all praise to Jesus and praise to his name. And that got me to the point where I managed to get free of the critters that had a hold of me. And God showed me exactly when I had picked them up. But once I was free of that, all kinds of things, wonderful things started to happen. I had words of knowledge, I had words of wisdom, I had all kinds of things. One day my, my son who had gotten a knife for his Christmas present had lost it, couldn't find it anywhere in the house. We turned the whole house over and he was getting upset. And I prayed and I said, God, where's this knife? He showed me a picture. I went to the couch, I reached into it. I didn't bother even removing the cushions. I reached into it, grabbed it, and pulled it out. That was happening all the time. As a matter of fact, whenever we lost anything, my son would say, Dad, did you pray about it? <laughs> God cares about even the small things like that. 
And it's important to listen to what God is saying. As I said, wearing with, walking with God for a long time, the sense of newness and excitement can wear off. It especially wears off if you've given words that were either hostile, we received a hostile, a hostile reaction, or we're just ignored, dismissed. And the natural tendency in that case is to pull back, to, re to step away from it. And that also dulled my spiritual ears. And last week, Barry talked about uh, the impossibility of us transforming our lives without grace, which is absolutely true. Without grace, we are doomed to follow our sinful nature into all manner of unspeakable acts. But we have already received grace when we receive Jesus as our Savior. It's there. It's ours. It belongs to us. And nobody can take it away from us. And we should live it out with him as our Lord. How well we respond how well we do that depends on our response to him and the leading of the Holy Spirit. And I've often heard it said that we can't do anything without the Holy Spirit. And that is also true. But if Jesus is our Savior and if Jesus is our Lord, we already have the Holy Spirit. He's living in us. So he's there available to us to do the things that he calls us to do. It's already there. We don't need to wait for him. He's here. He's now. He's with us. He lives inside us. He guides us. He empowers us. However, it is up to us to respond. And our responsiveness is the measure of our surrender to Jesus' lordship. So many people have accepted Jesus as their Savior, but they refuse to follow him as Lord. They continue in their old lifestyles, and it is, requires some effort. We can't expect him to do it all. Now I've got a little story. I had some people that I knew some years ago. I knew them. I, they were in, I was in relationship with them for about 10 years. I haven't seen them lately. But that was one of their favorite sayings. They had two favorite sayings. One was, you can't do anything without the Holy Spirit. And the other one was, the church isn't praying enough. And it was repeated week after week after week after week after week. And finally, I got sick of listening to it. So I said, are you praying? Well, um, no. And every week, we get the same message from them. The church isn't praying enough. And every week, I started asking the same question. Are you praying? And every week, the answer was the same. They accepted no personal responsibility. And I suggested to them that if God was laying this message on their heart, then they were ones being called to pray. Does that make sense? Yes. Amen. Amen. They weren't praying. They wanted somebody else to do it. They wanted God to do it for them. So these people, they would go to every conference, every special speaker, every special meeting, every, every gathering that they could possibly go to. And they had received multiple prophetic words. They had received touches from God over and over and over again. But every time they'd receive some new touch, it would take them about 10 minutes and it would <laughs> back to nothing again. Because they weren't willing to put any effort into following and obeying what God had told them. They weren't trying to do anything themselves. And their excuse was, we can't do anything without the Holy Spirit. They had the Holy Spirit. They just needed some get up and go. They responded to those words with momentary enthusiasm and then they just slide right back onto the morass of discouragement because God didn't change anything. They'd skip off to the next event, hoping for a different result. They were what I would call conference junkies, prophetic word junkies. 
people who go from place to place looking for the next touch of God to the next revelation, the next prophetic word that would change their lives without them having to do anything. And I would suggest that we shouldn't sit around waiting for God to do it all because Jesus himself said effort was required to gain the kingdom. Slide six, please, Brad. Luke 13, 23. He said to them, this is Jesus talking, it's read in my Bible, make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. And Paul compares us to athletes in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run but only one receives the prize. So that you may obtain it. Run so that you may obtain it. Run so that you may obtain it. Let me say that again. I want to hear an amen. Run so that you may obtain it. Amen. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. Should we not as Christians exercise some self-control and expend some effort to follow the Lord? They do not do it to receive something that is perishable, a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly and box as one beating the air. I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Also, in Ephesians, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not your own doing, as a... It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. Sounds like we have to do something, doesn't it? Which God preferred beforehand that we should walk in them. He's already got this planned out for us to do. If we don't do it, what happens? We get deaf or blind. And in 1 Timothy, therefore anyone, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house and ready for what? Amen. Amen. And in Ecclesiastes, whatever your hands find to do, do with all your strength. Am I preaching works righteousness? No, I'm not. I'm preaching obedience to God. I'm preaching surrender to the Holy Spirit. I'm preaching that you should walk according to what God gives you and obey what he lays on your heart to do and do it immediately. I remember driving along in my truck between two different job sites. And God said, you're not going to that job site today. I went, oh yeah, this will get me fired. <laughs> you're going to the mall. I go there in my grubby work clothes. I'm all dirty from concrete and dust and stuff. And there's a guy standing there and he just looks so lost. And I said, what am I here for? So I want you to talk to that guy. I want you to tell him about me. And I did. And he accepted the Lord. The other time I'm driving along and I'm getting ready to go to town because I got my kids are away. They're, they're with their mother. And I'm going to go shopping and I get dressed up in my good clothes and I'm going to go to town and do some shopping. And I got out to, to the door and God says, oh, you're wearing the wrong clothes. I went, What? Seriously? Yeah, I want you to put on that old jean jacket of yours, you know, the one with the magic mushroom on the back. And I want you to put on your, your high top running shoes and your jeans with the holes in them. And I said, hold on. What's up? And I want you to go to the mall again. I was okay. So I get to the mall and I, and I want you to walk down the mall. And I'm walking down the mall and I see three guys with long hair high top runners, ripped jeans, <laughs> and a blue jean shirt. And he's a 
there they are. They're yours. They looked at me. They thought I was a narc to begin with. But then they found out it was worse. I was one of those Bible bashers. Anyway, but they listened to me. They heard the gospel. They, were, they, they didn't accept Jesus, but they definitely heard the word. So am I preaching works of righteousness? No, I'm not. I'm preaching obedience. I'm preaching you that you need to obey God and you can never use the, the we can do nothing without the Holy Spirit as an excuse. Can't, not legal. Not available to you. I am telling you also that although salvation is free, rewards are earned. Is that a news flash to anybody? I was teaching in the Baptist church way back in an adult Bible school class, and I said, do you know the difference between salvation and reward? And 90% of the people in that class, oh, well, salvation is the reward. I go, no, it's not. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what Jesus taught. Think about the parable of the talents for a second. Everybody gets something. But the guy who does nothing with it, what happens to him? He gets that taken away from him. And it's given to the guy who did something. That's a reward. You don't believe me? Think about Revelation 22. Jesus speaking to John, he said, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I am going to give to everyone according to what he has done. There are lots more passages. I can't go into them all. But they all talk about a reward, and reward is not salvation. Salvation is not reward. They're two different things. Salvation is free. It's a gift of God. It's given to you not because you earned it, not because you're good enough, not because of anything you have done. It's all because God loves you, and he loved you enough to put Jesus on the cross to pay for the sins that you committed. And trust me, I committed lots of them. Reward is what happens as you follow Jesus, and God is extremely generous. He even says that if you give a prophet a cup of cold water, because he is a prophet, you will get the prophet's reward. I'd call that generosity, wouldn't you? So, obedience brings a reward. You can gain stuff, you can gain things from God, and you can also lose them. If you don't listen and you don't feel it. The Bible talks about, you know, when things are going to be revealed at the end, some people's works will be burned up and they will have nothing left except they will still be in heaven. And other people will get rewards. They will get crowns. Yes, we'll cast them at Jesus' feet and surrender them to him, but we get them. So I want you to get two things. Well, I want you to get more than two things from Samuel 3. First, first thing, the older generation has no monopoly on hearing from God. We're not the ones who are going to hear from God all the time. Don't expect us to have the word every time. The fact that we may be, in fact, the older generation may be experiencing some hearing loss. Secondly, we must help the young to discern God's voice. We must teach them that he's going to speak to them and that he can speak to them and that he will speak to them and we should encourage them to follow his leading. I'm glad to see some young people here this morning. I was kind of worried that it wasn't going to happen. God is no respecter of persons and he's definitely no respecter of age. All of us, those of us who walked with God for a long time must realize that the young may actually be better at hearing from God than we are. I'm talking to you. <laughs> and you. And you and you. You can hear God. And the reason may be that they have less baggage than we have. They may not recognize God's voice when they hear it, but God can and will speak to them. Amen. Amen. 
There are some things that Eli did wrong in this story, but there are also some things that Eli did right, and I want to focus on those things, never mind what the, the boys, his boys did. The first thing is that he helped Samuel discern who was speaking. Secondly, he listened to the prophetic word that Samuel brought to him. And third, he told Sam the seriousness of hearing and obeying God. He did that when he said, tell me everything and may God strike you and even kill you if you hide anything from me. Serious stuff. By now you're asking how this relates to my hearing loss. At least I hope you are, you haven't gone to sleep. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. First, let me tell you what the question was. I was sitting there, right there, right where the Salmon King's t-shirt is parked. And I asked, what has changed? Why don't I hear you like I used to? And here's his answer. This is what he said to me. You have changed. You used to approach every situation asking me what I wanted you to do. It didn't matter where you were or who you were with. You expected me to show up and do something. You continually asked me what I wanted you to do, but you stopped doing that along the way. Because of disappointment and discouragement and even through occasional disobedience, your hearing became dull, not all at once, but over time. You lost the habit of asking what I wanted you to do or what I wanted you to say in every situation. You became hard of hearing because you stopped listening. So my question this morning is, how's your hearing? Is it time for a spiritual hearing test like it was for me last Sunday? So I guess this is kind of an extended rhema space with a delayed word. So, worship team, would you like to come up? <laughs> 